All right, everyone, can you hear? Can we stay? I think we are about ready to kick this off. Everyone ready? You guys intense? No one's excited right now. We've got to do that thing that we said we were going to do. Yeah, bring some motion. Okay. All right, we can't do that. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Scott McCarty. I will start. We're actually going to do three of us. Uh, I am a, a senior principal product marketing manager for Red Hat, whatever that means. It's a really long title. It's like 13 syllables, six words. But uh, what that means is that I basically, I do global thought leadership for containers and kind of talk about containers and what workloads can be used and why you would use them and how you would use them and try to help people actually think about what they would put in containers and why. And so Steve and I have kind of started to mingle a lot because he does the same thing for OpenStack in a lot of ways. And so I will hand it off to you to. Right, so I'm Steve Gordon, uh, Principal Product Manager for OpenStack uh, Compute. Um, so not That's good. <laughs> Which one of us was that? Um, so not just the Nova project, uh, but also container workloads on OpenStack as well, uh, which is, of course, why I'm here. Um, Sebastian, principal software engineer, part of the Ceph engineering team, always rotating between different technologies, like Ceph in OpenStack, Ceph in containers, Ceph in configuration management systems like Ansible. And yeah. All right, so we're going to kick off then. <clears throat> so. I always bring up this slide when we first talk about containers and OpenStack because I think we get, we get this question all the time from different people. So I want to I wanna put up some questions to you guys. So how many of you use OpenStack? All right, good. We have a lot of OpenStack people. How many of you have used containers in general? All right, so good. How many of you use OpenShift? All right, so less OpenShift all the way but some. So, so I, I think... Often, if we get the OpenShift people and the OpenStack people in the room, there could be like a war about what, you know, sometimes the OpenShift people go, well, why would I use OpenStack? And the OpenStack people kind of go, why would I use OpenShift? Why would I use containers? <clears throat> so I have thought through this problem a lot to try to explain it to people because there's a lot of nuanced reasons, I think, to use them together. And so my, my whole premise, if you will, I hope to disprove anybody that would be in this red box or this black box, like, you know, I, and if you're, if you're staunchly in one of these camps, I hope to, to dissuade you and convince you that actually they are better together. So, and I'll give you a bunch of reasons why. So when we started thinking about this, I mean, at Red Hat, right, we, we support OpenStack a ton, and we obviously, obviously you know, pioneered OpenShift. So, so we kind of had to think about this in the context of you know, the operating system history. And I came up with, I think, a simple kind of analogy. It's about exposition and consumption of resources. So if you think about OpenStack, it's really good exposing certain primitives. You know, you can expose a VM which has RAM, disk, you know, network, uh, you know, physical resources essentially carved up as pieces of software. Uh, so software-defined hardware. But OpenShift, on the other hand, is very much about consuming those resources inside of containers. It's really fancy processes. So I, I will go a little bit deeper. So Exposition of resources. Um, if you think about, you know, back in 1997 or whatever, around the time I started in IT, you know, this is what we do when we get a new server uh, on the left. So you'd have, you know, you'd plug it in, and I, I thought this picture was pretty good because it even has a, uh, it actually has a network cable hanging out of there too, which I thought was nice and appropriate. So you, you know, you'd plug it in the network, and that was that was how you defined resources, right? That's how you exposed resources to the users. The systems administrator would literally have to plug it in and turn it on and then give them a username and password and then they would log in and everything was manual. Um, and that was a nightmare if you get to scale it. Even 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 servers I probably managed around that time. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really you know, not manageable. But, uh, but at the time, we weren't delivering stuff as quickly, so it was okay. Um, but then you look in the OpenStack world, it's really about turning that, that into something software, right? So it's about exposing VLANs and virtual machines and all these primitives that are now software defined, uh, cinder volumes, things like that. It's now much easier to just programmatically expose these resources to users or even allow them to get them themselves. But, but it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of about exposing those resources. I'd argue that if you think about uh, you know, a physical box, that was the primitive back in the day, and, and the application. We put the application on the physical box. Those were kind of the two main primitives. Then you add in a virtual machine and a virtual VLAN and a virtual cinder, vo you know, virtual volume and a, all of these things you kind of add. They're really extensions of the physical world. But on the consumption side, um, you want, 
to basically, con you know, if you think about the history of an operating system, right, even Linux, I, I, sh I joke on the, on the right, you know, this is like a PS output from my laptop. And each of these processes is basically consuming RAM and disk and blah, 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 but it's a single, it's a single system, right? Um, it gets a lot harder. If you think about it, you're using the kernel scheduler to schedule processes here. But if you get into a distributed systems environment, it gets harder. So you need something that can schedule it across distributed systems. Um, OpenStack can do that, but if you think about it, it's not as good. It's, its primitives are more related to the infrastructure than they are to the application. The container is really kind of an extension of the application primitive. So if you think about it, it's really kind of related more to the, the application than it is the virtual machine or the physical machine, which, which a virtual machine extends from. So this is really about consuming resources at scale across a cluster of things. And so OpenStack is, or OpenShift, I should say, is good at scheduling those across a cluster. And even an extra value proposition is, is you know, linking those together. If you think about the init system inside of a regular system, that's what kind of creates this PS tree, right? The init system determines what things start before what and what are, you know, what other things start things. In a distributed environment, you need something like Kubernetes or OpenShift to kind of determine what is linked to what. So I think I, I always go through the basics of containers because, because it, I, it's taken actually a long time to boil this down into something simple that most people don't understand. So a container, people always ask me, well, isn't a container like a VM? Well, when it's running, it's kind of like a VM. But it's, it's again, I'd argue the primitive is more related to, to you know, the application that is the, it's more about consuming resources in a fancy way than exposing resources. The application needs resources. It needs access to those resources. Uh, so when it's running, it's really just nothing more than a fancy process. I mean, if, if, if any of you guys are, remember Unix 101, you know, there are system calls between the user space and the, the kernel. And if you, you know, a container, whether it's Docker, LXC, LXD, any type of container, at the end of the day, what it is is either a clone system call, a fork system call, or an exec system call. You know, Red Hat, the way we do it with Docker containers is essentially a clone system call, which carves off some special, you know, virtualized resources inside the kernel. So you have, you know, your process ID table, your user ID table, your group ID table, you, you know, these different name, you know, these different data structures in the kernel become virtualized. You have like sort of sub copies of them. So they're just fancy processes. And then we wrap them in C groups and SE Linux. So it, it basically just makes it really easy to, it, they're, we're basically consuming, you know, resources, but in a limited way. And then when they're at rest, they're essentially just fancy files. When they're not running, they're just files. Um, and, and, and also fancy file servers. So it, how many of you have like, used a registry server and used Docker? So those that have done that understand this. So this, this concept of pushing and pulling files from a registry server that then you can run as fancy processes is really the fundamental difference between like, the way you would consume OpenStack and the way you would consume OpenShift. And I think when we, when we think about what we want to do with an application and why, that's kind of where this will become more and more clear. If you think about a, a virtual machine, the, the, you know, all of the, a, a, a virtual machine at rest and at run is really kind of the same thing. And I'll go deeper when I hit, hit, uh, hit into how I separate, you know, basically data configuration and code. So now that we've like built a primitive called a container that's different than a VM, that's more closely related to the application, we can do something different. We can actually, load at the factory as opposed to at the dock. So uh, take, a, take a scenario where you need to spin up 100 virtual machines that are part of an application and you have a one-to-one -one mapping between you know, each VM and the application. So say you're putting MySQL in one VM and you know, Apache in another VM and you're putting you know, other services in other VMs and it's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. To do that, you're gonna have to use some kind of automation every time you go to, so you would submit an API request, get 100 VMs back, wait for them to all be you know, provisioned. Then you would have to kick off some kind of post you know, provisioning automation like Ansible or Chef or Puppet, and then you have to wait. And if you're deploying like a giant JBoss app, that could take, you know, however long, could take a half an hour. And then if you do that across 100 VMs and there's some contention and resources and things like that, it might take an hour. So you're essentially loading at the dock. You're like waiting for, you're, you're basically, manu even if you're automated at the dock, and I, I joke, you know, in this, in this one, you look at these guys in the barrels and boxes, and they have, that's automation essentially. You know, they're not manually loading individual lamps at the dock, but they have lamps in the boxes and then they're putting those boxes on the, on the ship. So that's kind of RPMs and Puppet and Chef and all these things. We've tried to automate this process at the dock and it makes it a little bit better. But at the end of the day, I think we really want to move back to the factory and load at the factory.
Um, so <clears throat> let's think about, uh, so, so I kind of want to go from the analogy through time, right? So originally, if you look, you know, back in the day, I kind of talked about consumption and, expo you know, exposition and consumption of resources. If you think about it back in the day, how did an operating system work? Um, you know, Again, I, I said we brought in the physical box, we sat it there, people would log into it, we'd give them a username and password, they'd log into it, right? Um, but, but we did create something called an operating system that would kind of allow us, I, I actually would, at some point, would like to make another slide that kind of shows an hourglass. You know, we're trying to matrix a bunch of different applications with a bunch of different hardware. And the operating system is kind of the glue between. It's what, it's what actually exposes those resources from a bunch of different hardware to you know, a bunch of different applications. And if you're, expo you know, if you have a single process, it's actually pretty simple. Um, but then with the container world, what we do is we actually try to limit those processes. So they're, again, just fancy processes. But they still rely on a kernel. They still rely on a virtual machine or a physical machine. Um, it's not terribly different. And so, so people always struggle. They'll say, they'll say, well, are containers good for databases? And so I would challenge back, are processes good for databases? You know, and they'll say, are containers good for this or that? And I'd say replace the word container with the word process, and everything will become more clear in your mind, and you'll be able to architect everything the right way. Um, and then you take that to a distributed environment, right? You've now got a double problem. You've got a matrix, a bunch of different hardware with a bunch of different you know, systems installed, and you've got to do it, and you've got a matrix, a bunch of different applications with, a bunch, with this. It becomes a lot harder, right? So OpenShift is pretty good at scheduling processes, which map to programs or applications, and OpenStack is pretty good at exposing primitives really well, in fact. It's very API driven and very good at this. Um, so typically when I would do this, I would do a demo where I would show in OpenShift, I will log in and I'll ask for a volume, like a one gig volume to like spin up MySQL or something like that. And what you would have to do with OpenShift it was, if it was on bare metal is you would have to go pre-provision an NFS share or a iSCSI LUN or a real you know, LUN uh, ahead of time, a one gig volume. And if you think of, if you kind of do a thought experiment and think, well, if I do that at scale, I've got to go pre-provision a bunch of these LUNs ahead of time. So when my users log into OpenShift, they actually have access to data. That's a terrible way to do it because now I've got a, all these LUNs carved up. I mean, submit a ticket to your storage team and tell them you want a thousand one gig LUNs and they'll freak out. So, so you want to use, you know, something like OpenStack, which is actually quite good at this because it's software defined. And so I would do a demo where you know, OpenShift asks for a one gig volume and OpenStack just provides a cinder volume back to it that connects the PV with the PVC, or the persistent volume with the persistent volume claim inside of OpenShift and away you go. So um, <clears throat> we've got now, people say, so when I start talking about containers, I talk about OpenShift, they're often like, oh, well, but I still don't, they still don't quite wrap their brain around um, why that you would, uh, you know, essentially, still need open stack. They're like, okay, well, I could go provision volumes. I could put it in on Amazon, which you could do kind of the same thing on Amazon and Azure. But I'd say there's other, there's other problems to it, right? There's, I say in 1997, I had, uh, you know, processes, right? We just had standardized processes. I would move it, I would tell that into a server and I'd do a PS and I could see everybody's processes and that was totally fine. On the other end of the scale, you know, I'd, when I worked at a data center company before I came here, people would ask me, can, do you have two different data centers that are in different weather patterns? And so I'd argue it's really about tenancy and how much tenancy you want. And so there's, there are architectural times where you'll make decisions based especially around these two, around containers and virtual machines. Um, but sometimes if you, know, you don't want people to be able to see each other's processes, you're going to go to a container. Because at least if I am in a shell inside of a container, I can't see other people's processes. It's limited. Um, but sometimes that's not enough either. Sometimes I want a virtual machine. Sometimes I want a physical machine. Sometimes I'll say, well, I need two different physical machines, but they need to be in different racks. And then sometimes I'll say, well, I need two copies of the app running live in two different data centers. So I'd say that's one reason you'd think about you know, running containers and VMs. And then it's also about to actually get the value of containers, you have to be able to separate code configuration and data. So it's really easy to put stuff in VMs because I mentioned earlier, a VM running or a VM at rest is really the same thing. You expose a VMDK or a, or a QCOW2 file and it's the same when it's on disk. You stop the VM, you leave it there, you start it back up. It's the prim there's, no, there's no difference between the code configuration and data. It all lives on that disk. And so at runtime and at rest, it's the exact same thing. 
but with a container, they're actually very different. The only thing that lives in the container image is the code. So you think about MySQL, which was not designed to run in a container in any way, shape, or form, but it happens to be really easy to put into a container. So it's easy to put user sbin MySQLD inside of a container. You do a yum install of MySQL, you, you literally inside of a Docker file, you build the container, um, and that's all you have in there. But when you run it, you expose the configuration and the data to it. So Kubernetes and OpenShift allow you to map those resources that have been exposed to it into the container at runtime. So the configuration and the data live in the environment, the code lives out on the registry server, out on the fancy file server, and you pull down whatever copies of that you need. Now this takes investment. This is not free, right? It's actually pretty free to move to a virtual machine. It's not free to move to a containerized environment. You have to figure out if you can actually have good separation of code configuration and data. And I say code configuration and data is just the first step. Think about licensing and installer files and all these other nasty things, and that's why I say other stuff. I actually have a much deeper slide where I kind of go through all this, but it gets hairier from there. You know, licensing and even network problems where people ask what about, you know, using IPsec tunnels between containers and all these weird questions that come up. So I'd argue there's kind of three patterns that, that arise, right? There is containers on a virtual machine because sometimes I actually want the tenancy, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes it's containers and virtual machines working side by side to deliver an application. And that might be because I have a back-end service that is really hairy and I can't untangle the code configuration and data. So that will live in a VM. But I have some other services, that, like a front-end web server that's actually really easy to untangle, I can put in a container. But I still need to orchestrate those together in some way. Um, and then I'd argue the last one is actually running a virtual machine inside of a container. And this is when people's heads usually explode. They go, why would I ever do that? Um, so so I, I joke that a container is a fancy process. A virtual machine is just a really fancy process, right? It's not, or maybe it's a little bit less fancy process. I don't know. I haven't quite decided where I want to put that. But um, at the end of the day, it's really just an even more isolated process, right? It uses hypercalls instead of syscalls. Um, and we will talk a little bit about all three of these um, and when and where you would use these different things and why we're using them in different places. But these are kind of the three main patterns. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Alrighty. Steve. Um, so Scott, I guess, uh, has framed this in terms of why OpenShift and OpenStack together. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the how and what we've been doing to make them work uh, better together as a combined solution. Um, so when we initially released OpenShift version 3, uh, which of course was re-architected around Kubernetes and Docker as kind of the central um, components of that framework, um, we, did a, we did, even from the get-go, have customers who were running that on OpenStack um, and you know, thinking, this is, this is awesome, this is what I want, but um, there are some other things they, they would express that they would like um, OpenShift to be doing and OpenStack to be doing to work together and to be able to take more advantage of both of these investments. Um, so in terms of looking at that, we had a couple of architectural tenets to what we were trying to do. Uh, so first of all, uh, we do want to maintain uh, technical independence from the underlying platform uh, of the containers themselves. So you should be able to take your container that's running um, on OpenShift on OpenStack and run it on other platforms as long as they support those core technologies as well. Um, we're also trying to, although we want the management benefits that these platforms give us, uh, we want to avoid redundancy in terms of eliminating layers between the containers, um, the virtual hardware, and ultimately the hardware as well. Um, so not introducing performance penalties and so on uh, wherever possible. We, we want to avoid those. Uh, we do want to give, so kind of separate from the technical independence of the container itself, uh, we want to give the orchestration engine, uh, in this case Kubernetes, contextual awareness of the platform it's running on. Uh, so that it can handle uh, interfacing between the container workloads and the platform and taking advantage of those resources that are available in the infrastructure. Uh, and finally, obviously, the end goal of all of this is to simplify the management both for the um, end users of OpenShift who are deploying and managing their applications and also for the people operating the OpenStack infrastructure beneath. Um, so with all of that said, kind of what's in the box? What are we doing with the OpenStack shared services? Um, so in, this is kind of our current uh, reference architecture that we're working on. Um, so we have the OpenShift masters, nodes, and registry uh, running on top of OpenStack shared services. Uh, we are deploying those um, using heat orchestration templates. Uh, so heat being the orchestration system that OpenStack uh, has, has available built in. Um, 
So what we're doing there, um, for those who are familiar with OpenShift, OpenShift has the OpenShift Ansible installer um, for deploying OpenShift itself. And the way it works is kind of you, um, before you set it up, you pre-provision um, some resources, so say VMs, networks, and so on, and you provide them to the Ansible installer, um, point the Ansible installer at them, and it installs OpenShift on those resources. Um, the heat templates primarily are aimed at providing some of that initial pre-provisioning automatically. Uh, so they will create the neutron network, if applicable, um, create, uh, create the virtual machines, plumb them together, create some supporting infrastructure virtual machines as well uh, from an OpenShift point of view, and then call the OpenShift Ansible installer with the right parameters to say, um, you know, set up Kubernetes to use the OpenStack Cloud Provider plugin for, um, implementation uh, and go from there. Um, so at the moment, um, as well as setting up the virtual machines in the Neutron network, um, we're setting up uh, load balancing uh, for the OpenShift master nodes using the Neutron um, OpenStack networking load balancer as a service version one API. Uh, and we'll talk some more about what we want, what we want to do in that area in a minute. Um, in terms of the networking itself, uh, so we have in OpenShift, both OpenShift SDN, uh, which is one of the implementations, and there's also a flannel networking option. Um, so for POC type deployments, uh, we can use OpenShift SDN, or, or POC is probably the wrong word, but we can use uh, OpenShift SDN um, as the OpenShift networking solution with Neutron underneath, but then of course we have overlay networking on overlay networking. Um, so to avoid that, we can also use flannel in host gateway mode um, for the container host networking. Uh, and then just provide the Neutron network as the overlay solution. Um, and again, there's more we want to do in this area in the future uh, with things like Project Courier, uh, and I'll touch on that in a second as well. Um, so all of this, um, and, and uh, Scott mentioned also the Cinder volume support. So uh, one of the things I should mention around that is that the Cinder volume support and a number of these things actually um, the, the work is really, I mean, there is orchestration work in the heat templates to set it all up. Um, but the, the key plugin work um, to make all of this hang together is really in Kubernetes and, and done in such a way that it can be reused by other solutions. So for example, uh, people may be familiar with OpenStack Magnum, uh, which is a project um, that also uses heat actually to deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack. Um, it can also in the future leverage some of these features via the Cinder volume plugin to Kubernetes. Um, the load balancing is part of the cloud provider framework implementation in Kubernetes. Um, which also has recently been expanded to uh, support later versions and so on. Um, so all of this is going to be encapsulated in a reference architecture uh, we're working on and plan to release on the customer portal in the near future. Uh, so that will be a reference architecture for OpenShift uh, 3.2 on OpenStack Platform 8. Um, and if you want to follow that along, uh, follow the development of that, so I'll be when it's available, uh, blogging about it on redhatstack.com, uh, and you can also follow me on Twitter, XS Gordon, um, and I'll be talking about that further there as well. Um, so diving in a little bit deeper there to what we're doing um, with these services. Uh, so Heat, as I mentioned, is providing orchestration services for OpenStack clouds. Um, I guess the closest colliery would be something like uh, Amazon's Cloud Formations API, and in fact, uh, there is um, some support for a cloud um, formations uh, API exposed from OpenStack as well in Heat, although it's fairly basic and um, you know just bare minimum kind of stuff. Um, in terms of uh, what it's doing here, so as I mentioned, um, it's pre-provisioning the OpenStack resources. Um, it's also similarly used by uh, Magnum. So Magnum is also using um, Heat to handle the creation of resources and so on. Um, and in both cases, you know, part of, as well as developing the Kubernetes plugins, um, but we're also expanding heat support for various services. So for example, uh, load balancer v2 support was added to heat uh, in the Mataka cycle, which forms the basis of our next OpenStack release. And we'll be able to take advantage of that in the future as well. Um, so we configure um, the virtual machines with that access to the correct network and storage. Um, and then we deploy OpenShift on it and register the, Kubernetes, the nodes into the Kubernetes cluster that results. Um, in terms of networking, uh, so currently uh, we're relying on the OpenStack SDN from a tenant isolation point of view. Um, we want to get a little bit further with this in terms of, um, as I mentioned, we're currently running Flannel host gateway mode on top of a Neutron network. Um, there's a project called Courier in the OpenStack uh, community, K-U-R-Y-R, um, which is 
basically uh, a bridging framework or interested in bridging between uh, container technologies and the OpenStack technologies un underneath. Uh, so one of the things that's now in scope for that project is developing a container networking interface plugin uh, for Kubernetes and other things that use CNI uh, to be able to talk to Neutron directly uh, and basically eliminate some of the uh, additional layers in this area. Uh, finally, with the storage, um, so container hosts are able to consume OpenStack storage, and we'll see in the diagram in a second that we do that in a number of ways, particularly with Block coming from OpenStack Cinder. Um, we also are able to provide the Cinder volumes directly to the tenant application uh, that's running on top of OpenShift um, for stateful applications, so the database server or whatever, whatever other application you may need to maintain state for. So this is um, the current draft um, image of the reference architecture layout. Uh, so if we look in the top left-hand corner there, I mentioned uh, in the opening that there is this concept of an infrastructure server or bastion node uh, where we're doing, we create that VM and we do a number of things there, like that's where we run the Ansible installer from and that's also where we do uh, at the moment, interesting, um, we do the DNS, so we're just running bind there at the moment um, to do the DNS in injection for the OpenShift hosts that we're creating. And I'll talk again uh, about that in a second. Uh, we also have a load balancer. So as I mentioned, LBAS v1, or there is an option if that's not available in your OpenStack cloud, uh, we can also deploy at the moment a virtual machine just with HA proxy, uh, which is more suitable for POC, but at least gets you started. Um, we have the routing. Um, and the OpenShift router node as well. Um, bottom left-hand side, we have three OpenShift masters uh, for high availability. Um, those are load balanced by that load balancer node at the top. Uh, we back the storage for those with Cinder volumes as well. Um, and then on the right-hand side, there's actually an error in this particular diagram. So the, the router and the registry uh, for the container images that are shown here would actually be running on the OpenShift masters, again, backed by Cinder. Um, and then we have our OpenShift nodes where our actual workloads run uh, with Cinder provisioning uh, volumes uh, for passing through to those applications and the OpenShift private network, be it with OpenShift SDN or with Flannel, as I mentioned, in host gateway mode. Um, so obviously we're still uh, working on this and there'll be an updated version in the final reference architecture, uh, as well as instructions on how you go about replicating this setup in your own environment. Um, so I, men I mentioned the uh, kind of product versions that the reference architecture is built around. I should say that uh, if you go on GitHub um, and search for OpenShift on OpenStack, the heat templates are freely available there and will also work with OpenShift Origin um, and also the RDO OpenStack distribution. So if you just want to try it out at home or in the lab or something like that, that's an easy way to get hold of the technology. Um, in terms of kind of what next, uh, there's some other OpenStack services we would like to be able to take advantage of uh, from Kubernetes and as a result OpenShift. Yeah, but a separate project that's broken out of OpenStack Neutron uh, around load balancing called Octavia, uh, which we hope to support in a future OpenStack release and take advantage of. Um, we want to replace that DNS node where we're deploying uh, bind at the moment with actually using the designate DNS as a service REST API, um, which can be backed by bind or a number of other DNS servers. Um, to handle our DNS needs for the OpenShift nodes, uh, and also to be able to plumb in file storage um, from the Manila project, which again supports a number of backends, um, including CephFS and Gloucester. Uh, and the final thing there is that this current reference architecture, all of the validation um, is based on running uh, OpenShift in virtual machines on OpenStack. Uh, the next step is to try and revalidate this using Ironic um, and bare metal. So, Still with the advantages of OpenStack management of the infrastructure, uh, but with the bare metal performance of running OpenShift on those bare metal hosts. Um, so with that in mind, I've kind of, so I guess the way I'd position it is that Scott kind of talked about applications and OpenShift. I talked about the crossover between OpenShift and OpenStack and how we're making them work together. Um, I'm actually gonna get Sebastian to come up and talk more about um, how Kubernetes and um, container technology is helping us change the way we manage uh, the infrastructure layer as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So, um, as Scott mentioned, we have several footprints, uh, several patterns, um, and the one I'm going to be discussing now is basically running OpenStack uh, in containers, or just like Scott put it, it's more like running your virtual machines inside containers. Um, 
basically infrastructure services uh, can run in containers. Um, they can obviously benefit from the good of containers, uh, from the updates to the upgrades. Uh, so there is no reason why they shouldn't be containerized. OpenStack is a really huge beast. Um, so it's not only containerizing OpenStack, but it's more only um, containerizing the storage part as well. So in OpenStack, we have the compute side. We use the default backend, which is just uh, fine. Um, we have the network backend handled by uh, OpenB switch. And then we have the storage backend. Uh, in this case, we are not really using the default backend. We are using Ceph because it's part of our reference architecture. And um, yeah, we are basically all moving toward a unified tool to manage all of our containerized platforms. Uh, more and more platforms will be containerized, all the applications are being containerized. So well, there is basically no reason why, uh, even if infrastructure services are not con directly consuming resources but are providing them, uh, we could run them in containers. And so this is this exact, the exact same principle for OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack, the way you should picture it is just OpenStack is one another application part of your entire um, container stack. Then it brings the interesting, uh, interesting architecture, um, the hyperconvergence. And the main thing with hyperconvergence is a really buzz, buzzy and really fancy word, simply to say that we are collocating hardware, uh, storage, and compute resources on the exact same machine. This has several advantages uh, because we are reducing the hardware footprint and then we are increasing hardware utilization. Thanks to that, we, this, well, this basically comes with a well, kind of a huge uh, drawback and that's one of the reasons why we couldn't really do hyperconvergence um, without containers. Uh, when you do that, you really have to, or you must really uh, restrain the resource all of the resources from your storage resource, from your storage and from your compute. So you really need to have this ability to properly isolate and restrain all of the resources. If you don't do this, then you can end up in two really bad situations where you have CPU or, or just memory starvation. And well, no one wants that. Having kind of a black sheep taking down all of your entire infrastructure, it's just really bad. But the good things with container is that all of these like um, control groups, part of the kernel, uh, are brought by the container engine itself. So if you don't have this, then well, from an operational perspective, it's really difficult because you have to configure your environment. You have to set up, well, control groups, profiles, per services, and then you have to orchestrate all of that with, with your configuration management system. Um, but with containers, already is, everything is already there, so it's just well, really snappy and there is nothing to really configure. You get this really good and really nice isolation from the container engine itself already. So it will simply configure everything from the C groups. When it comes to NUMA awareness and CPU pinning, this is something that is already available as part of OpenStack. So these bits are already exposed and it's fairly easy to configure that. Uh, one another good thing with uh, hyperconvergence is basically when you're collocating compute and hardware resource resources, um, you can benefit from a local heat. Uh, when a uh, VM issues an IO, you can potentially end up having the I.O. being written on the local disk and then because we are using a distributed system, the, rec the replication will go on and move to another node. But we're basically saving one, one hop on the network here. And yes, of course, um, as mentioned already, we're really taking advantage of the, all the goodness of containers with upgrades and from the installation to upgrades. So as mentioned earlier, we are not using the default backend for OpenStack when it comes to storage for virtual machines, uh, but we are using Ceph. So it's always good to take a little step back and well, then explain why, we're, why we are using, using Ceph and why we are like investing so much in Ceph. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Ceph, Ceph is an open source, uh, massively scalable software-defined storage solution, which basically allows you to retrieve, consume uh, all of your data through several interfaces from uh, such as objects, files, and block. So Ceph is really flexible and it was really built from the, from the get-go to work on cloud platforms and really be deployed at, at scale. One of the goodness of Ceph is it runs on commodity hardware, so we're just picking your vendor of choice and then you just configure it with several disks and then you're good to go. So it's completely hardware agnostic. As mentioned, it's kind of a unified layer because you have several interfaces that you can use, 
block object infra system. What makes Ceph so unique is um, the algorithm called CLOSH, CRUSH, stands for Control Replica Replicated Under Scalable Hashing, Control Replication Under Scalable Hashing, sorry. And it basically allows us to compute the location of each object uh, without uh, having to do any lookups on any hashing table, things like that. So every time we want to put an object into the cluster, we're computing its, lo its location. So it's kind of really, uh, really fast and Crush is really powerful because it can, it's, it's basically topology aware, so you can just design it the way your data center is being designed. From a product perspective, um, Ceph is really well integrated into a management console. It's the Red Hat console, Red Hat storage console, from, where, from which you can basically deploy Ceph, uh, go through these, this entire, um, entire management life cycle uh, with upgrades uh, and stuff like that. So to visualization, of course, of the, uh, the health of your cluster. So I already mentioned that it's uh, really designed for cloud infrastructures and emerging workloads uh, because of, of this really distributed design with shut off in architecture and no single port of failure. And the good thing with, uh, to note as well is that Ceph is being used by the vast majority of all of the OpenStack deployment these days. Uh, it has been the case for like two years, and if you look at the reports from the OpenStack Foundation survey, um, we're kind of up to 60% of adoption of Ceph into every single OpenStack deployment. And that's also, well, one of the reasons why it's part of our, our reference architecture. So this, this, this picture shows you the current state of the integration of Ceph in, into OpenStack, and it's really important to just well, really picture that and because it will really help you understanding why we are investing so much into Ceph and since the very beginning. Uh, so at the very bottom, you have, well, basically your Ceph cluster. And then the first interaction that we have with OpenStack is through uh, Keystone and Swift. Uh, basically, Swift is um, the equivalent of Amazon S3, which just basically allows you to put data as objects, so it's a REST gateway interface. Um, we have such component within Ceph, it's called Rados Gateway. And this gateway is connected to Keystone, so it can authenticate. Uh, Keystone is the identity management service from OpenStack. So it does all of the authentications from services to users. So Rados Gateway basically supports um, any uh, protocol from Keystone, from V3 to uh, V2 to V3. Um, the support was just added into the latest version of Ceph into the product. And this, base, this uh, Rados gateway really acts as a replacement for, for Swift. Uh, LibRados is just a library that allows you to interact with the Rados object store because everything in Ceph is an object, so, and the main entity of Ceph is called Rados. Now, if, you, if we go from Cinder to Glance to Nova, what we see is, so Cinder is the block device functionality uh, from OpenStack providing persistent storage to virtual machines. Glance is the image catalog, and Nova is just the compute resources, uh, providing resources, so virtual machines. Um, all of these interfaces are connected to libRBD. Uh, RBD is Rados block devices. So it's another interface that allows us to basically present um, Rados object as block devices. And the good thing of having like Cinder, Glance, and Nova well integrated with, with uh, libRBD is that we can basically take advantage of really nice features from Ceph with, from snapshots to copy and write clones and basically clones. So all of that is uh, really well integrated. We, more recently, we have, we have Manila, which is a distributed for system as a service uh, from OpenStack, connected to libcephfs because the metadata or the distributed file system from Ceph, it's called cephfs. So it's, once again, it's uh, well integrated. And the latest one, which is not supported yet, but it's currently being QA'd and will soon be available, it's Silometer, because Silometer uses, or internally using, uh, uses Gnocchi uh, to store all of the metrics. Silometer uh, is the telemetry system from OpenStack, so it just, it's basically gathering metrics from the entire OpenStack environment. These metrics are being stored as objects into the Ceph cluster. Taking a step back into the hyperconverged infrastructure, um, so you can really picture it and it's really easy to understand. Uh, at the very bottom, you simply have your traditional Red Hat Enterprise Linux kernel. Um, 
Then if we go up, we have the KVM hypervisor plus the Docker engine. All of the boxes that you see here are basically containers. And even for VMs, so that's going back to what Scott, Scott was mentioning, uh, what you see when, you, when we are mentioning VMs, it's effectively having the QMU KVM process running within a container. Then all of the uh, boxes from OSDs, OSDs are object storage daemons within Ceph, and these daemons are responsible for storing data, replicating data, backfilling, scrubbing data, all of the things that you're kind of expecting from um, a storage solution. And all of these are being containerized. Same goes for the OpenStack components. Uh, from the network with Neutron, with Neutron and OpenV switch to the compute resources with Libvirt and Nova Compute. So now introducing the work, that, the things that we have been busy working on. Um, we have two main projects. Uh, well, we're not owning the Collab project, but we are participating uh, into the Collab project. Um, it, it's uh, from the OpenStack Big Tent. It's uh, another project that is um, basically aiming, running all of the OpenStack services within containers. Yeah. So it just gives you this, the necessary bits to run all the OpenStack components. It gives you all the Docker files and all the entry points. The deployment can be orchestrated through Ansible. That's a default method uh, to deploy your fully containerized OpenStack platform. There, are, there, there is a prototype on um, Kubernetes. And it's been held by the uh, Cola Kubernetes project which basically has all of the files to run a fully containerized environment. You pass that file just like a template when you use, it's really similar to what we do uh, in OpenShift. You just pass a template and then it will get everything being deployed uh, into containers. The second one is Ceph Docker. And um, Ceph is part of the reference architecture of, uh, our, of, of all of our, our deployments. Uh, we basically had to containerize Ceph. So the, the goal of the project is simply have all of the Ceph daemons running into containers. Yet again, this project can be deployed, uh, and by default, the recommended way for now is just to use Ansible. Uh, we have several components. Uh, uh, we can work with uh, Atomic um, Platform, so we have a really nice, nice integration with all of the systemd's uh, unit files to run our containers and to manage them through systemd. And we also have a prototype running uh, all of that workload uh, within Kubernetes. From a product perspective, uh, we have su currently support for um, a tiny piece of containerization. So as of OpenStack uh, Platform 8, we now have a tech preview, which means that we just support uh, compute not being containerized, it's just what I showed on the picture. Uh, to aiming toward, of course, this uh, hyper-converged model that I just described earlier. Uh, the same goes for Red Hat Storage, uh, Red Ceph Storage, where we already had the ability to run Ceph in containers since the 1.3.2 version. And more recently, we just released, with the new version of RHCS, uh, a new version of that container with the new content and uh, more features. So we already have um, some of the bits in place to have the ability to deploy hyper-converged infrastructures. Uh, but it's, it's an ongoing effort, and it's basically uh, evolving all the time. And every single time we will be releasing a new version of the product, we will get more and more. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. That will just complete all that. Yeah. So I wouldn't make noise. Um, so these are free. We're going to give you guys these takeaways. Um, you can use these, share them with whoever you like. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to go back to the original thing of, of you know, you know, consum you know, think about consumption of resources and exposition of resources. Um, and I realized I used developers here. You know, you think I mentioned, you know, pack at the factory, right, or load the container at the factory. That means the developer's laptop, right? If I can, if I can separate the code configuration and data. The configuration and data live in the environments. So the sysadmins control the configuration and data for production, but the devs control the configuration and data for dev. And that's beautiful, but they control all of the code. And what you know, ships between the environments is just the code, basically. So you get this really clean you know, you know, separation of concerns there. Um, and then th that's kind of at the app layer, right? But then at the cons you know, at the uh, resources layer, I'd argue, you know, wh which if you think of a VM, or VLAN or any of these things really has primitives that expose network, storage, disk, RAM. Um, you know, the operators can control that easily or can 
at least control the policies under which they want these things to be exposed. So like in a development environment, they might share these with a, you know, developer might have quotas and things like that. So if they log into OpenShift, they may only be able to grab so many volumes or things like that. But in a production environment, if you think about it, it's really just policy that the sysadmins will probably propose. You know, you may give a pool, an e, you know, online retail space, you may give it, you know, a maximum amount of resources it can consume. And one that, that Steve and I had chatted about before and one that's actually built into that heat template is actually the ability for auto scaling, like at the open stack layer. So, you know, hypothetically, or, or, or you know, you can imagine some use cases around this. Imagine a user logs in, or a policy even logs in and says, I need a thousand more containers because I see traffic spiking at a certain, you know, I see it spiking at a certain level and I see the velocity going too high, I could now spin up a thousand containers and I might also know I can't spin up those thousand containers until I spin up another hundred VMs. So the heat template has, you know, auto scaling built into it and it, it can detect CPU itself and scale automatically or you can imagine the platform, the container platform could reach back to OpenStack and say, hey, I need a hundred VMs, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run out of resources and, and kill the app. So, so you start to get into this, you, you start to understand really where the exposition and consumption of resources are. Um, and honestly, it, it simplifies it for us and for you. So, so we talked about the three footprints of kind of the three different ways you use con containers. I think people's mind blow when they see that we're actually going to deploy OpenStack with containers. But if you think about OpenStack, it's really just a microservices application. And so it is actually easier to deploy with containers. Um, and then when you think about it for your end users, the people that are actually going to consume it, you know, the OpenShift plus OpenStack really becomes the distributed operating system. That's the thing that exposes resources, just like a kernel did back in 1997. And OpenShift is the thing that consumes those resources, just like a process. And if you think about it, it's just fancy files and, you know, and, and fancy resources, which is a VM, basically. And so with that, I think we'll open it up to questions, and all of us can hammer them. And then we will let you go drink beer. <laughs> so, any questions? Covered a decent amount of material. <laughs> Maybe triple OS. That's what I think we'll call it, triple OS. Yeah. Any questions? There's got to be questions. I know. Did everybody understand, even just understanding details? Because, I mean, St Steve and Sebastian went through some pretty deep stuff. Well, I guess we nailed it now. Do we have what? I still didn't quite catch it. Ah, right. You okay. Mean, so the, quest, the question was uh, whether we still have the issue with VXLAN uh, plus another overlay, so overlays on overlays. Ah. Um, so that was what I was talking about when I was referring to if you use OpenShift SDN and then Neutron underneath, yes, we have that challenge. Uh, if we use Flannel for the OpenShift networking in host gateway mode, uh, we don't. So it just goes straight to the Neutron network. So then we avoid the overlays on overlays that way. That's what we currently do. Longer term, we want to use uh, Courier to have native integration in Kubernetes um, for it directly to talk to Neutron and to be able to ask for more stuff, basically. Yeah, which would be awesome. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, OK, the. Oh, yeah, it's very possible. Yeah, so, it, well, so let me, it, it may be a surprise to people running OpenStack platform today. Your VM is already in a container of sorts. It's not in a Docker container, but it's in an SE Linux uh, C groups managed isolated container that way. Um, so in, in this, what Sebastian was talking about, we're effectively, because we're containerizing the rest of the infrastructure layer, including Ceph, in Docker containers um, on, on the platform, um, it makes sense to move this, the QMU process, to that as well, just for consistency and for packaging, so that everything on that compute node is coming from the registry 
in the same way, rather than kind of having half and half on the same node, which doesn't really work from a management perspective. You're actually complicating things further. Does that make sense? And, and I'll add a little bit to it, because I kind of mentioned, like, Docker containers are really no different than LXD or LXC containers when they're running. It's at rest that they're different. It's the format that's different and the way you move them around. But when they're running, it's the Linux kernel creating data structures. So, you know, back to Unix 101, when you create a process, it's an exec or a fork, typically. And you can limit an exec or a forked process inside of C groups and SE Linux. You can create a separate SE Linux context for them to start in. Docker containers use a clone, which also virtualizes process ID, UID, and some other things, a little bit fancier than a fork or an exec. But at the end of the day, the C groups and the SE Linux are identical. So if you look at LXC and LXD and even Docker containers, the way they run, it's all de depending on technologies in the Linux kernel at the end of the day. So a, a KEMU KVM process can be wrapped in C groups or SE Linux. And uh, one other thing I'd add to it, there is sometimes advantage to even, or I should say the Kubernetes, there are certain people in the Kubernetes community that are also interested in orchestration of VMs using those same primitives, right? Because sometimes they like to use their YAML files to define things. And if I have 99 containers in one VM, it's annoying to use a different language to define that stuff if I just need one VM. So there's times when since a VM is really just a fancy process, just like a container is a fancy process, I could now orchestrate it with some of the same toolings. There's investigation even at a layer above just the process layer. Even us with, with the way we install the OpenStack, there's an investigation there. Right. That's so. Uh, yeah. question, Are we planning to containerize infrastructure services from OpenStack, like databases, queues, and load balancers? Uh, what well, the answer is yes. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, currently, as we mentioned, we just had the compute node tech preview and kind of nicely sidestepped that, and it's all awesome. Um, but the if you look at the Cola project, there are already um, image definitions for all of the other related services. Um, some of those may end up being super privileged containers because they need certain things. Uh, the libvirt one is a good example where I believe that's the case. Well, even the virtual um, machines, right? Because yeah. they need access to DevKVM and stuff. So. Yeah, exactly. So, th But that is the longer term plan. It's certainly not in the tech preview we have out there at the moment. And it's kind of not even read out OpenStack Platform 10, probably beyond that. So 11 plus kind of time frame. But Yes. Yeah, and, and we're doing that at both layers, right, for the, for the processes. Because if you think about it, it's an identical problem on the bare metal serving the OpenStack, because it is basically in a microservices app. But then when you're exposing it to your users, you probably want Kubernetes YAML files that do that exact same thing for your app. <laughs> so yeah. it's just like inception, right? I, yeah. I will say with Glare as a specific example is interesting, um, because we actually have some high touch customers we're working with who are running um, Red Hat OpenStack in containers on Kubernetes already. And depending on your tolerances, they actually just use um, MariaDB without Galera at all and use mm -hmm. Kubernetes replicas to handle their HA. So there is a, obviously, if one of them goes down, there's a short term outage there while Kubernetes notices kicks one back up, like it's a replica of one. Yeah. Um, but from an OpenStack API perspective, for them, that's acceptable, which is interesting. It may not be the way we go from a product perspective, but it's something to think about um, just in terms of getting your mind around how you migrate traditional infrastructure to this model, if that it's makes sense. It's kind of the old uh, HS type. I was going to say, with, it's with using Pacemaker, it's the exact exactly. same thing, like it, failing over with Kubernetes instead of Pacemaker, and then restarting. And back that. in the day, we used to write checks yeah. all the time that were fancy in Pacemaker, and now you have a single tool. You have Kubernetes. It's actually really good at HA migration, just like that. In fact, it's, it's, it's cleaner in a certain way because you can separate the code configuration and data very easily, and so if you have that, code and configuration tucked somewhere that you can get back to it. It's just a process restart on another node. And it's very quick. I don't it can say be very that too loud. I know, I shouldn't say uh, it too HA people will be, uh, Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of what our HA guys are working on around OpenStack at the moment, obviously our HA architecture is very um, pacemaker heavy at the moment. And they are looking at ways to make use of systemd in particular system to D. handle some of that workload. So on the local host, systemd can really handle, is the process up, no, start a new one. Kind of a watchdog. Um, yeah. And then we're going to gradually yeah. move to a lighter weight but still effective HA architecture. Um, and ultimately with containers expanding on that again. But yeah. I actually wrote a demo a long time ago where I failed containers over with Pacemaker. Right. So it's just a process. <laughs>
Any other questions? Oh, good, we're getting more. All right, this guy went first. I couldn't quite understand. You asked if we looked at the performance for. Oh, yeah. In fact, there was talks earlier today. I think Jeremy Eater did so some talks on this. Performance impact Sorry, yeah, yeah. on running VMs into containers, right? So the performance for impact example. of each of these patterns, basically. Yeah. I, I should say that mm -hmm. um, is also, I don't know exactly which room it is in um, at 445 or in the next session. There's a performance talk. And immediately after that, we're having a meet the performance experts. Uh, so Jeremy and a heap of other guys, including myself, will be there um, for more discussion of that kind of thing. Uh, so obviously, I'm coming at it from a product management side, but they're the guys actually testing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So they can maybe answer more questions in that area as well. Yeah, Jeremy Be Eater and Joe Mario will be there and a bunch of others that have done that stuff. The, the short, quick answer, though, is there's there, startup time, there's clearly performance differences, right? I mean, containers start way faster than VMs. So VM starts in, on average, I think, you know, two to four minutes kind of thing, you know, whereas container starts in milliseconds. So there's definitely that from a scale up and scale down perspective. But the, perf the, the short answer on the running performance of them, it's, it depends. Sometimes it's not bad difference. Sometimes with IO, of course, it's still one that's not as good. It's better in a container than a VM. It just, but there's other times where we've actually seen a little bit of a performance increase on a VM because of the way it's able to cache things and do weird stuff. So it's a nuanced answer. Because I've talked deeply with Jeremy about this. I think we had one over here. All right. So the question was, I think, uh, how does Magnum play a role in Red Hat product plans and positioning? Correct? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, um, Magnum is still fairly early stages from a product perspective. Um, so it is available in our RDO community distribution. It's packaged there and available for trying it out and getting a feel for it. Um, one of the things that came out of the last summit um, that we went to, the last OpenStack summit, there was a lot of discussion around kind of what is the scope of Magnum? Because um, there's kind of two divergent views as to should Magnum just be something that is kind of an assist uh, for provisioning your container orchestration engine and then getting out of the way and you would use that native like uh, cube control for Kubernetes to interact with the orchestration engine? Uh, or should Magnum be an abstraction of all of that, or attempt to be an abstraction of all of that, um, where you use the Magnum REST API for the end-to-end -end management of the lifecycle of your containers? Um, the ultimate outcome of that was that Magnum is going to focus on the container orchestration engine um, provisioning, scaling, um, but your actual interaction with it is via the native tooling. It's not going to attempt to abstract the container orchestration engines. And there's a separate project, uh, which I think was originally going to be called Kiggins and is now Zun, uh, which is going to try and be more of that lowest common denominator API for people who want that. Mm. Um, so that was one of the kind of hanging questions that we wanted to see answered in the community um, before we started taking concrete steps from a product perspective. Um, so that's something I'm looking at for, again, further out time frame, like ROSP 11 plus kind of thing. Um, how do we take um, what we have in RDO at the moment, do the integration into the installing, uh, installation platform, uh, make it work well um, with the OpenShift and Atomic properties, um, and you know, make an end-to-end -end experience out of it. Um, it's certainly very useful for just getting a container up on OpenStack very quickly. Uh, it's a matter of how far up that, how far does that use case go before you need full application lifecycle management from something like OpenShift, um, and that's the question we're still trying to, working with customers and partners on what the answer to that is. Any other questions? Yes, we do. It's on the, the GitHub. The, the question was, do we have a publicly yeah. accessible? Docker, yes. Dockerized Ceph. We have it's images. Uh, images are available on the Docker Hub. Uh, Docker files are available on GitHub slash wild.com slash Ceph slash Ceph dash Docker. Don't we have? Yeah, we do have. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the Docker awesome. files are available uh, on the Ceph namespace on GitHub and under the Ceph Docker project. Yeah, so just uh, so people know, um, the slides are going to go up on the Summit website if they haven't already. Um, it may be a slightly older version of the slides than the one we use today. We're fixing that up at the moment. But the links will all be there uh, so you can dig down and follow up uh, and grab the technology, basically, to try it out. One minute. 
Any other questions? All right, let's drink beer. <laughs> All right.